Well, um, thanks for having us back. It's a, a real honor and pleasure. The last time we were here, last year, we were both very sick. We got some sort of mountain sickness, and it was our sort of debut session at EGS, and everyone assumed, especially, um, um, yeah, I mean, some people assumed that we would not, we were not able to deal with the mountain air and stuff like that, you know, the Dutch, you know, coming from this kind of lower um, um, land, you know. So um, we actually started, Vinka and myself started Metahaven in 2007 after indeed, Seven. after indeed we started working together in 2003, 2004. And at some point we came at a junction where we realized that we wanted to do this um, something close to forever or at least for the next time. So then in 2007, we kind of founded Metahaven as a design and art studio. Uh, and we are also a collective, so we work with actually quite some other people uh, in our office, uh, studio, workspace, collab, whatever you want to call it. So <clears throat> I'll talk for a bit, hopefully not too long. Uh, and then we will answer the questions uh, together. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we also had a really nice session today uh, with the, the group and um, really enjoying it and learning a lot. So the lecture today, Information Skies, is concerned with a few of our most recent projects, emphatically ones that have taken up a space of imagination that was opened up by recent geopolitical twists and turns. And geopolitics has always been a kind of concern of us, but the way we've taken aim at it has kind of always changed a bit. Uh, normally, actually, our whole talk is about propaganda, but it isn't always completely, because all propaganda as a form of what Arkila and Romfeld have called epistemological warfare has a component which ever more consciously and often cinematically plays with our being and belonging in the world uh, and has a way to penetrate through the rational armor that we tell ourselves we still possess. So... We are not aiming just at the propaganda part of propaganda, but at the kind of the, the things that it makes us feel, so to speak. So as designers, we are supposedly well suited to deal with the subject matter as we are supposedly, supposedly, I'm saying, trained to see through the visual codes and tropes that perpetuate in propaganda. But of course, we aren't trained for that. The term propaganda itself is even up for debate. Some people found, find it sound highly old fashioned. It's probably true. And there have been these more recent terms like information war, which also have disadvantages because they render everything in this kind of belligerent sphere. Um, so today we're going to talk mainly about uh, three um, main projects. One is a recent film we did, The Sprawl, Propaganda about Propaganda. People that take part in the, the seminar have already seen, seen it actually, so for some people here in the audience it will be a kind of repetition. Uh, although we won't screen the entire film, obviously, there's no time for that. Then um, we are moving into a research project that sort of sprawled out of the sprawl called um, Pastiche of Ghosts. And we'll end with Information Skies, which is right now a screenplay scenario which we will start uh, recording as a short film actually in two weeks from now. And in these three projects, you can see a kind of progress from like where we started, when we started doing what we were doing, and kind of how we evolved into the, um, into the subject matter. But first, on the left-hand side, you see a proposed cover for a book that Phaidon Press was going to publish on graphic design. And the title of the book was Graphic Agitation 3. And that shows pretty much what the state is of critical design today. It's this sort of um, practice on the edge of the extinction of the CD-ROM, or the, of the CD. That's why we our proposed cover, which we said we will propose a cover. If you don't like it, you don't need to use it. Uh, and you don't, we, we won't do the project. But if you like it, you must accept it as is. And they ended up not liking it. We called it Graphic Agitation 3, the definitive mega mix in this reference to the end of the CD, you know, when you had all these trans house CDs, which were all kind of ultimate mega mixes and definitive mega mixes. And in it, there's three photographs. One is the a photograph of the designer collapsed on the desk. On the other is a, is a still from the film Children of Men. And the third is three militants waving the flag of ISIS. Um, 
So in a sense, it was a kind of provocation to the would-be client that they eventually didn't want. But it, it shows this title, Graphic Agitation 3, shows that, the, that critical graphic design, political graphic design has become genreified to an extent that you can sort of put it apart from the other things. You can say there's like normal graphic design and there's critical graphic design operating kind of sideways from it, which is a sort of problematic, it's itself a very problematic state if that's indeed the state of graphic design. We don't see ourselves only as graphic designers. We also are very interested in art, um, making it, but also viewing it and experiencing it. And on the other hand, you know, you can say that design is also constantly expanding to the point that no one knows exactly what it means anymore. We were actually so naive to ask the question to our uh, seminar, uh, what is digital design? We should have never asked that question. <laughs> First, most people didn't care, or people didn't think about, hadn't thought about it. So it's something that we should maybe not. We should leave the discussion on what exactly it could be. Is maybe this is one answer of what it could be, but there's many other answers, obviously. And to the right, there's a wallpaper graphic that we did for a show in Spain, which says, "Silent Dazzle, the ruins of Gaza are the ruins of our civilization." Yeah, you want to do? Yeah. So yeah, actually, this is how we all started to get working together on speculative identities for uh, places that were not really visitable for normal human beings, like the, the Principality of Sealand, a former data haven, former internet entrepreneurial island in the North Sea that during the dot-com boom had a mega plan for itself to, to, to invent itself as a sort of space outside of jurisdiction and extra an exterritorial enclave where you could host your data. And this place was started as a kind of squat on the sea with, a, with its own fake prince and princess and all, all these kinds of things. And you know, in the sort of mid 2000s, we thought that it would be very interesting to design an identity for them. So we approached them and we said, why do we have to wait for someone handing us something? We should want to proactively work with them, etc." Uh, and we were in contact, and anyway, this is an old project, so it's just how we began. And this is Sealand, um, and these are images for, from our first book, On Corporate Identity, which co collected a lot of our early things and early stuff. Uh, and um, we were also really interested in Sealand as a model, Sealand as a, as a way of addressing the world, as it were, and there was Hard and Negri's empire at the time, which had a strong influence on us when we were starting out. So we made Sealand Empire. The artifacts of graphic design, and not everything that we do is always very clearly legible as being something what it is for or what it is about. So we like that there's a kind of discovery process in that. Uh, so you just saw stamps. These are fruit stickers made for fruit produced in Spain, actually. So what is the problem of um, one of the problems of uh, our practice, and I think any practice that is involved in um, internet or is interested in the internet, is the, to the extent to which you have to show technology to talk about it. And that's something that we'll address in the, mainly in the project Information Skies, because it's like when you now look at a film from the 90s, you know, about the internet, and you see a Nokia phone, or you see like these interfaces, it's like the notions that are being addressed may not be outdated, but the technology itself outdates really fast. And that's why we're fascinated by filmmakers like Andrei Tarkovsky, for example, uh, who are able to uh, actually create science fiction around um, speculative, technological, societal, and planetary developments without actually showing any of the real events that have supposedly have led to this state. So, the, the, the main event is sort of happening off screen and you sort of have to accept that and you become, you, you, become, you enter this zone. So this is one concern. So this is an image from another video. Uh, this particular video piece, which we did two years ago, was um, using models from Constant, New Babylon, Constant Neuenhuis' New Babylon project, which was a 1950s, 60s, 70s, uh, utopian, dystopian, speculative city plan that he built in the form of drawings and models, etc. cetera. Um, and um, we combined it with, with images that were more sort of kind of from daily life. Um, and 
the point here was that actually this new Babylon could be seen as a sort of blueprint for what the internet and particularly um, mobile internet to us is to us today. So there's, an, there's always this dilemma with the internet of showing on the one hand you're either you're talking about stacks and structures or you're to talking about emotions and affects and you have this dilemma of either you're showing all these devices, your smartphone, your, your computer, your laptop and your iPad versus you're talking about things that you really can't see, like no one has seen the internet. And so we need these images, we need to film undersea data cables to make it tangible. And this, this project dealt with this notion of the stack, which is, is developed by Benjamin Bretton, our super admired uh, friend, and also a um, prominent um, voice at EGS. Um, uh, the, these are little stacks that deal with this situation around Western Sahara, where we once worked for a little bit, won't go into it too deeply now. Um, and it's also possible to produce pop with, with, through, with, through your kind of fascination with the internet, as we do with the singer, composer, musician, artist, Holly Herndon. And these are all um, screenshots from our first forays into music video together with her and our first our forays into t-shirt making and fundraising uh, campaigns with her and others. Which also shows that our design language is not a straightforward, let's say, put the message out there and that's it type of language, but it's a language that's quite layered, quite wants to be quite, it's sometimes and getting increasingly kind of more narrative as a, as a visual language itself. <clears throat> so all this is preliminary for the first project. So in 2000, Ram Koolhaas discovers that the, words, the world's major currencies put together spell yes. This actually happened. 2016, Metahaven discovers that the last name initials of the world's major authoritarians put together spell pet. Putin, Erdogan, Trump. So uh, our, our interest in, in propaganda doesn't come from uh, an interest in, 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 in neo-totalitarianism, but definitely, you know, it kind of runs, it runs simultaneously. Um, we never made a long film before us, but we started working on the sprawl in 2014 and everything was quite intuitive everything was kind of coming together as it happened because as, as designers we had never really made written a script or anything like that and the project ended up sort of sort of thrown in our hands and started to grow and it grew from a, a kind of fascination with the way in which um, what you could call propaganda but then propaganda that is hosted on huge platforms like YouTube therefore escaping most of its sort of geographical limitations or sense of purpose that it would be only intended for one audience or another, um, it becoming a kind of new visual language and a new narrative language, particularly the way in which um, the conflict unfolded uh, with Russia and Ukraine, a conflict that we had a rather you know, personal relationship with, forced so because the um, MH17 flight that was downed in July 2014 over eastern Ukraine had departed from Amsterdam. So the, the thing was quite, quite, quite inescapable. Also in the, the Dutch media, which normally have a sense of lethargic sleep for anything that's happening further than 10 kilometers away from the Dutch border. Um, <laughs> so anyway, the sprawl developed and we, we wanted to, um, there's, there's a sort of uh, log line about the sprawl that I, they will read now, which kind of gives you the impression of what the film is about. Two unknown men speak on the phone. They discuss their involvement in military operations in eastern Ukraine, accompanied by images of a chaotic stroll through a nightly Russian forest. A plane passes through the moonlit night sky, and a voice recites a poem by Anna Akhmatova, while a woman near darkness looks at herself in the black mirror of her computer screen. Then she looks at us. Enter the sprawl. 
Silent sword fighters stare at us. Silent actors look at us. They gaze at their screens and at the deepest corners of YouTube. Strange and colorful interfaces overlay their appearance until medium and message become one. So, um, yeah, there's a, a, a way in which this film is about the way that we receive stuff that's out there on, on the internet. It's the way that we receive narratives and the way that they become more than just propaganda. So instead of being in a position where we would be outside of the propaganda, we try to become kind of one with it as much as we could. And we did so together with three um, people that each, each of them had a completely unique contribution to the film. Um, one was Benjamin Breton, because we felt that Benjamin um, is like no other capable and, 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 and has rehearsed in his work ways to, to explain the, 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 the manner in which a global computational structure like the internet or like uh, social media is able to distort um, geopolitics. So when we are thinking about, let's say, Russian propaganda or any propaganda that has a geopolitical uh, impact of sorts, we, are, we tend to attribute it to persons. So we, we super fast go from okay, that's Putin, etc. We forget that the, the, the enabling structure of this propaganda is a technological megastructure that Benjamin will talk about in a minute. So we found that an important element of the story. Mona Lisa Garavi, who is an um, um, uh, artist and writer, is someone who was really, really interested and good at reacting to visual material. So we showed people that we interview lots of material and she was really into going into these images and Peter Pomerantsev wrote in 2014 a book about Russia that we uh, read breathlessly and then we started interviewing him as well it turned out that after writing this book he had there was a narrative in the book and the narrative was increasingly anti-Russian increasingly you could see it as something that would be deployed in the atmosphere of certain think tanks, certain NGOs that are at work, you know, to frame certain narratives, and that's mainly in a kind of Washington DC area. And he, in the book, he, he approaches Russia in a, on an almost literary, in a literary fashion. It's absolutely beautiful to read. Um, but the interviews themselves turned out quite differently. And it turns out, although, that he is still a very entertaining character to listen to and look at. So let's start with the beginning, the right, the, right the very beginning of the film. Они довели до перекрестка, машину оставили. Пацаны пошли дальше сами. Так. Все, машина ушла туда, куда надо. И дошла нормально все. Я Там понимаю. Вы начали непонятные звонки от 10 человек. От каких 10? Ну, на, на его номер начали звонить разные люди, представляться, что то один, то второй, то третий, то четвертый, то он говорит, я же заебу, говорит, потом говорит, сам начал звонить. Ну, да, он сам. И он взял, выключил телефон, блядь, и пиздец, блядь. И мы не знаем, где машина вообще. Где? Машина в России. Ну, блядь, вчера говорю, блядь, мы не знаем ночью, блядь. Тихо льется тихий дон. Желтый месяц входит в дом, входит в шапки на бегрень, входит желтый месяц тень. 
Эта женщина больна. Эта женщина одна. Муж в могиле, сын в тюрьме. Помолитесь обо мне. Jacques Ellul, who wrote the classic study of propaganda in the 1960s, French philosopher, called it mass persuasion. He didn't see propaganda was good or bad. He said it was a, a part of modern society, part of technological society, a part of mass industrialized society, whether it's getting people to wear condoms or to get them to become Maoist. Soviet propaganda used to be, you know, believe in communism, Moscow is the shining beacon on the socialist hill. Now it doesn't seem to be about that. It's just about deconstructing the other side, disrupting, um, disrupting Western narratives um, of any sort. There's a steady stream of disinformation um, whose purpose seems to be to sort of undermine the very idea that truth is provable. So the other thing that the film is about is this deep st stabilization of, of, of reality and truth. And um, yeah, so that's that's one of the themes that it goes into from different angles. And Peter's angle is very much one that goes through the geopolitical, but there's also other angles that can be have to do more with, for example, the interface or the way in which interfaces decide for us what we see and what we think when when we see what we see. Uh, also with regard to virtual reality and augmented reality. <laughs> Искусство начинается тогда, когда человек с целью передать другим людям испытанное им чувство снова вызывает его в себе и известными внешними знаками выражает его. Так самый простой случай. Мальчик, испытавший, положим, страх встречи с волком, рассказывает эту встречу и для того, чтобы вызвать в других испытанное им чувство, изображает себя, свое состояние перед этой встречей, обстановку, лес, свою беззаботность и потом вид волка, его движение, расстояние между ним и волком и тому подобное. Все это 
если мальчик вновь при рассказе переживает испытанное им чувство, заражает слушателей и заставляет их пережить все, что и пережил рассказчик, есть искусство. Если мальчик и не видал волка, но часто боялся его, и, желая вызвать чувство испытанного им страха в других, придумал встречу с волком и рассказывал ее так, что вызвал своим рассказом то же чувство в слушателях, какое он испытывал, представляя себе волка, то это тоже искусство. So the... And then the other angle is coming from um, Benjamin, who, who, who talk about this structural component of planetary scale computation. 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. This is the moment where the modern state is codified, where all of the sort of structures, its, its spatial distribution is, is set. And it's a particular kind of subdivision of geography, by which you sort of imagine a horizontal map. And We subdivide the land, we, the, the, the land is subdivided, not the sea, not the air, not the electromagnetic spectrum, but the land itself. And it's a particular kind of topology, if you think about it, right? Um, it, it's a loop topology. Inside the loop, there is a certain um, uh, regime of sovereignty that comes with this organizational structure. There's the, the right to make the law, to issue a currency, a flag, World Cup team, Whatever. And this becomes a kind of standard format by which the surface of the Earth is subdivided into these, into, into these p political units. What I'm interested in is both the ways in which planetary scale computation, um, which I sort of describe as this accidental megastructure that we've, we've produced over the last 25 years, has both um, uh, distorted and deformed this traditional logic. And then the film takes, a, takes that immediately up into a kind of more fictional realm. На улицах города я не больше, чем призрак. Я обитаю в мегаструктуре. Я привязана к небесам, подвешена вверх ногами в неопределенности, без конца и начала. Звездный потолок, парящая мегаструктура, облако. 
блестящая поверхность реки, зеркало, неправда, ложь, технология, патология, желание, платформа, дорога, карта, сеть, назначение. So we fast forward a little bit into the film. Um, the, there's a rapid succession of events that are then starting to happen. Uh, we, we're looking at um, protest videos from back rain. We're looking at, we're going to analyze like the way that these YouTube videos are sort of operating. And then uh, we're diving into the disappearances of two aircraft, MH370 and MH17, both, both of which created especially the first one created huge uh, uh, conspiracy theories about what happened to that plane. The second one we know, it was downed by, um, by a, a surface-to-air missile over eastern Ukraine. Uh, but then, you know, the, the, the visual imagery that was produced uh, in search of these planes or in search of an explanation for what happened is the particular focus of the uh, next segment. Охеревший, вот этот ролик надо точно в интернет выложить. The citizen journalist, or even just the person on the street who takes a picture or uploads a YouTube video of something they may or may not be able to describe, and what that shares with, uh, you know, what we think of as a more centralized database, is that it still has someone has to make it legible if it's going to enter a kind of political conversation or a social conversation, and who gets to make it legible, I think becomes like the, the, the interpreter of those images. Um, it becomes all the more uh, important. And I think this one is Benjamin who addresses the, the cult of trying to capture the every event on, that's happening in some sort of image visual representation, so a sort of forensic regime, as it were. The idea of a completely self-transparent global grid by which every event, every molecule, every everything could be addressed, could be counted for, could be calculated, could be governed according to uh, some uh, algorithmic principles such that um, nothing could escape because there is no outside, is itself, a, at the very least, an incomplete ambition. Um, and uh, at one end and at the other, um, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of dangerous psychosis. With the, with the, you know, with the MH17 photographs of the missile launcher, you know, how they're framed becomes just as important as the fact that they were allowed to be entered into a conversation or like uploaded into the conversation. And that framing then becomes as important as the existence of the image, if not more. And so that's why I think the, the indexical of like, you know, for example, captioning or um, circling parts of highlighting the blurs of the image and, and giving them uh, giving them a kind of like narrative expression becomes so tricky and makes the work of credibility and verifiability even even more important. So you get that sort of, you know, forensic or scientific um, impetus, like who can, who can uh, test the image against, you know, these verifiable factors of where it comes from. And I think, I think that that is, uh, you know, makes people enormously nervous. It makes me enormously nervous on some level.
Yeah, the, the other trope that's running through the through the film is Russian dash cam videos that are, you know, these kind of popular, endlessly recycled videos on the internet where the most bizarre car accidents are happening, such as this truck tilting over. This is a bit further again. <laughs> politics in an era of globalization. The breakdown of the sense that actually the governments can do anything. You know? It's that sense of who's really in charge, you know. Your government can do any policy it likes, but, uh, you know, a butterfly flaps the swings in China and, you know, a village in Birmingham is, is unemployed. It's part of the paranoia and part of the sense of globalization, which in Europe heightened even more by the, you know, the idea of a, an EU above national governments. So governments used to be like in the West. Look how big and strong we are. Now they're like, we can't do anything. <laughs> we can't do it. It's like, it's the EU. <laughs> you know, it's globalization, sorry. So governments get into this and get into this game and actually end up exacerbating the lack of faith in them by saying, we can't do anything, you know. Определять и изменять конституционный строй Украины принадлежит исключительно народу и не может быть узурпировано государством либо должностным лицом. Неважно, каким способом и образом Они пришли к власти, в том числе через кровь. Um, when we say Twitter revolution, what do we mean? The disputed June 12th elections in Iran, when that then erupted into street protests in Tehran, uh, you know, over the course of the next couple of days, there were enough people on the ground in Tehran with cell phones to get messages out, and then those got rebroadcasted all over the world. Была и целая череда управляемых цветных революций. Понятно, что люди в тех странах, где были эти события, устали от тирании, от нищеты, от отсутствия перспектив. Но эти чувства просто цинично использовались. Этим странам навязывали стандарты, которые никак не соответствовали ни образу их жизни, ни традициям, ни культуре этих народов. В результате вместо демократии и свободы хаос, вспышки насилия, череда переворотов. Арабская весна сменилась арабской зимой. Well said. <laughs> so the, 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 I mean, it's not, don't take, don't take me to that word, you know, it's more like that he always repeats that, that take on world events, basically. The, the film also contains a number of kind of music videos that are kind of musical intermediates. All the music is done by Kudel, um, who we collaborated with with great pleasure, and we admired his work already when we started working together and that has only increased. And this particular video um, works around the notion of uh, aesthetic terrorism. <laughs> NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, has an identity problem of sorts. To have meaning, cohesion, purpose, and reasons to be funded, this alliance needs enemies. Okay, we'll skip that. That's, that's actually a whole stuff on like Russia Today, RT. So now we'll skip to the end of the film. And that end of the film contains for us a very a few, it contained for us a, a few points that were very important for the kind of continuation of working in this realm and on this theme and things like that. Um, at the level of the interface, though, I think longer term, this is, this is where the, the capacity for a kind of, of um, a real splintering in the way in which we perceive reality at a political level is possible. You know, if you think of something like um, 
augmented reality, right? Google Glass or, or Microsoft HoloLens or, or Facebook's Rift or something like this. Um, what you have in a way is a kind of, of, of a, an immediate lamination of a narration of the real that is brought directly into how it is we perceive that, that, that reality. So it's not just I see a person across the room, but I see their name, their information about them. Any interfacial regime, whether that's Google or Microsoft or anything else, is a way in which this enormously complex system of the vast, you know, global supercomputational network is made simple enough, is narrated enough, that people can make use of it. In the course of doing so, this incredible reduction takes place. And in that reduction of all the possibilities into just a set of buttons with words on them that you can click, there is inevitably a, high, a highly ideological distortion of all of those possibilities into, into a framework. He says framework, but that's somehow been cut. Well, Tolstoy's formulation of art is interesting in that it's an artifice that has a, a truth at its heart. Whether or not it appears as an actuality or um, has a sort of uh, shell of truth, there is some sort of emotional um, depth or an emotional legibility at its center. I don't know if there can be any such thing as a kind of pure art, untouched or unfettered by the demands and uh, the power grabs of society, but the aestheticization of politics allows art to become politically expedient or to empty, uh, empty certain categories and classifications and aestheticize them to the degree that power feels um, necessary. When that compression of, of possibilities into an interfacial regime um, is one that is not just providing things that you can do with machines, but things that you might do with reality, that, that are subtitling the real, clean and unclean, ours and theirs, us and them, uh, halal, haram, the, the capacity for a kind of cognitive fundamentalism is not only a danger, I don't, in certain ways I see it as almost an inevitability, such that what you, you see and encounter is pre-narrated for you by those subtitles. So the sprawl was released as a uh, feature-length film, but also as a kind of installation version, which we actually quite like because people have a more spatial relationship to the film rather than just sitting watching it. And it's also been realized as a website, sprawl.space, which is rather a kind of information sculpture where we've actually also included overlays over the videos that are massively kind of sculptural, like a kind of like pur purple web chocolate or something that overlays those videos. So it's actually playing with sculpturality, which is actually an interface that then overlays something that's no more than a YouTube channel. So we eventually brought the sprawl back to its large parts of its origins, our YouTube, and we brought it back there. Um, so the, the sprawl sets out with this notion of disinformation, filter bubbles, myths, fantasies, interfaces, and the post-democratic redistribution of the tools of production, the means of production. Um, this is a quote from Peter Sloterdijk that we love, and that's been also figuring around in the... Um, in the seminar about attention and about bubbles. We won't go into it too much. Post Snowden security, invest in the Swiss cloud, very apt here, like in the midst of the mountains. Um, 
nominally, we are shifting a little bit away from these structural issues around the internet to much more the kind of more, the more mental, like psychological aspects maybe. Um, Tolstoy, what is art with the RT logo and a billboard we did in Bucharest uh, this month um, where we also used the RT logo and the what is art question by Tolstoy. 4K GoPro drones flew over Syria. The Internet Party of Ukraine had Darth Vader run for office. And ISIS Adobe Premiere licenses were shipped from the North Caucasus. Uh, and actually, the part about the Internet Party of Ukraine and, and Darth Vader running for office is true. And that leads us into part two, pastiche of ghosts. Escape now, hug later. Han Solo, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, 2015. Ukraine is a future disguised as a country. It is the heart of a ruptured millennial Eurasia, an open source fab lab for geopolitical fantasies. The territorial players of a fading post-World post, post War II settlement, the European Union, NATO, the United States, the International Monetary Fund, and Russia, celebrate a raucous free-for-all over the breadbasket of Europe. Devoured and consumed by external forces, Ukraine hurts from internal nationalisms, separatisms, and cosmopolitanisms. Aging Western men crusade into Ukraine on chartered coaches looking for long-legged true innocence, registered trademark. An invasion never quite talked about on the same terms as the Russian intervention in the headlines. But the political promise given by the West is eventually the same one as the pensioners Stalingrad of male sexuality, a loving partner, between quotation, part, uh, quotation marks, financial security, stability. EU treaties and IMF payments don't come for free. They involve the scissors of cultural surgery and the changing of standards, pushing Ukraine away from its ancient sub-economy of favors into dreamless, off-the-shelf modernity. One of its most intriguing political entities is the Internet Party of Ukraine, or IPU. Founded in 2008 by Dmitry Golubov, the IPU earned international attention last year when it runs someone dressed as a Darth Vader costume for mayor of Odessa. Along with an entourage of Star Wars characters, the Majoral, the Majoral Hopeful appeared in a series of remarkable YouTube videos. In one clip, Imperial stormtroopers ascend the Potemkin stairs in Odessa, coalescing into a large circular formation on the square at the top. In another, a choir of young pioneers chants propagandistic hymns to atonal avant-garde metal music, while Chewbacca stands in their midst. In some of the IPU's most visually iconic pieces, Star Wars characters hug and stroke Cossack monuments and social realist statues in hypnotic, cinematic, slow motion. Borrowing from one of the West's most potent and vexed cinematic fictions, the IPU's videos are masterpieces of what one might call design encryption. The creation of an enigma, not by mathematical computation, but rather by an impervious interlinkage of visual clues. In a sobering analysis published in the Washington Post, political scientist Eric Heron argued that the real role of the IPU is to distract. Quote, while election fraud was occurring on the streets and in the electoral commissions of Odessa, the world was instead paying attention to the oddly charming Vader story, end quote. And indeed, as several media sources have reported, fraud did occur. But there is no evidence that the IPU made any efforts to cover it up. It rather created an absurdist media offensive that ridiculed all political representation the zenith of loss of faith in politics, lyrical and cynical in equal parts. Darth Vader is hardly an icon of the left. Originally, the Imperial Chief was much smaller and rat-like. But as Star Wars production designer Rolf McQuarrie recounts, quote, the guys who made the costumes came up with a good idea, the concept of this huge, towering figure you had to look up at, end quote. A completely masked villain, Darth Vader moves around like a brand of himself, a pop relic forever returning from the past. But in the IPU's telling, he is Cossack. He takes off his black helmet and overlooks the step away from us. Analyzing the relationship between politics and nostalgia, 
Artist and theorist Svetlana Boim suggests that a ladder, quote, works as a double-edged sword. It seems to be an emotional antidote to politics and thus remains the best political tool. In our age of global suspicion, when politics has become a dirty word, smart politicians try to appear unpolitical in order to reach that, di that disenchanted and not always silent majority. They play the saxophone like Clinton, dan dance like Yeltsin, kiss like Gore, and win judo matches and love dogs like Putin." End quote. Darth Vader is known by everyone. His plans are known by no one at all. Surreal fantasies like the IPUs are fitting in an age of empty political modernity, where the lack of a common dream leaves a void big enough for a pastiche of popular ghosts to emerge. The IPU's YouTube clips and roadside billboards propose illusion as a form of progress. In 2005, before his political career took off, Golubov was sentenced for his work with Carter Planet, a website of Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian credit card fraudsters that emerged out of the rampant chaos of post-Soviet capitalism. With no legislative or regulatory oversight in place, the gray economy of carding became a serious problem because, as Hacker.ru noted, quote, we Russians lack a sense of limits. Golubov was swiftly released with the help of two deputies of the Party of Regents, the Russophone faction that controlled much of Ukraine until the 2014 revolution. One of them, Volodymyr Demekin, said that he wanted to help Golubov to study and work, since he is a talented man who represents the best of our young generation. The other deputy that paid had no idea who Golubov was, but testified as a favor to his friend. The 2015 vote in Odessa was won by the Party of Regents. The runner-up was Alexander Borovic, the advisor of Mikhail Saakashvili, governor of the Odessa region and a former president of Georgia. The, revolution, the revelation of election fraud triggered a protest led by Saakashvili. Golubov accused Saakashvili of corruption and Saakashvili res responded by calling Golubov a cur. The IPU Internet Party of Ukraine is a spiritual act of astroturf rebellion. It hijacks the democratic process using collective memory and science fiction to actualize a lucid dream. As the fighting inside and over Ukraine continues, more of such designer ghosts can be expected to appear. <laughs> Дарт Вейдер, кандидат у народні депутати від Інтернет партії України. Information Skies, the last one of the three projects. Um, so this takes on this notion of um, virtual reality to a point where we thought that it would be, should be going in, in the way that we think about film and the way that we write script. So I'm going to read a, a script, the, the narration script of the film, which is not so long, so we will probably end in time. Uh, and then we're going, we still have to record the film. So what you're looking at are production sketches. And the, the film is half, half live action, half animation. Uh, the two working together, because obviously we, we became very interested in anime, and we wanted to create, in a sense, our own abstract anime film in a way, and it has anime elements, but you, they're not really anime. The fighter sits. His long-nailed girlfriend is absent-minded on her phone. We adorn. We are the silver. We are dragons, newborn from the mouth of an unverified source. Desperately seeking, we seem to have found that source, the road through the forest, the clearance each other, another. The supermarket opens to a queue of early risers. 
The mundane is only the best excuse to talk. Let's talk about the apartment, or about the dishes, and who left them unwashed in the sink. Our daily rituals are paintings, our shopping list to poems, full circle, face the void. The hole in the sky left as a courtesy by the last person who used the bathroom. The weight of the soul measured in terabytes. I'm looking at you, but I'm staring at the tundra. With my eyes closed, at least I can remember. We have a plot, formerly known as Dream. Now we have a video to prove it. Everyone can see myself from the emptiness within, an eyeless face inside an idea. Someone just disappeared into the station hall, the crowd, where I brought a device, our future, my truth for all. Suicide bombers are also people. Think about it. We all have mothers. When we were born, we were not allowed to die. Death is virtual reality. Catch up with this world. Watch the mothers wave their children goodbye, crying. The fathers dig a grave, sweating, scorching heat in a step of pixels. There is no one in the grave. Their only relief is bottled water. The fighter watches TV. His long-nailed girlfriend is still on Snapchat. We have an okay life. We are gold-plated. We are the caretakers of the hunt inside the theater. On our quest, there was nothing at first, but then that sky on the second night. Each truth, each galaxy an option. That large screen ahead is beaming with stars, waiting and blazoned with signs. Of you being right, that's what they say. All this time they say, together, metallic, lit from behind. Shared a thousand times and counting. A grim cost, called on for support, brings much needed food and foul false hope. Search through their past, recall what you read somewhere, sometime in school. These faltering batteries, dim light of your echo, are kiss in a fur coat of darkness. I'm holding you close. I can see through the mountains, blinded by color. Please help me, I'll pay you much later. We have a plot, formerly known as Dream. Now we have a video to prove it. Everyone can see myself from the emptiness within, an eyeless face inside an idea. Who knows what's true? Who knows what's not? Mother knows. A parallel house. Mother knows where. He's alive. She makes him breakfast. The love of the morning, their laughter, sounds of the kitchen, curtains waving, windows open, sign in to watch the sequel. Nothing happened of the sort. There still is a chance. No proof, only rumors. Defend us. Please help her. She'll pay you for the key to the door of that house. Everyone lives, everything wants, no limits, only visuals. Our laptops, our visors, globes turn dark, short on imagination, movable titanium, switch off the haunted gaze, a graceful landing on the soil. The territory, the way things were, is a trauma and a luxury, as readily a friendly older man sits down with us and gives us tea. He asks us to agree with him that there was no house, and there are no mountains, an endless grassland with nothing there, how could we disagree? We grapple for words, gasp for air, for the judge has not seen what we have seen. Your honor, we reply, we were just there, you weren't. There are mountains all around us, we fought like dragons. Here's our flag of digital satin, and our mother of bleached blue linen, and her forlorn son back home, our brother, hear his joyful laughter. You must be dreaming, says the man, or you spend too much time elsewhere. Nowhere in this barren land are mountains. I haven't met the woman you seem to know so well and hold so dear. Her son, I know of him. He killed himself and others. There's nothing left but a name that's in the papers. Hidden in the high grass lay the fighter and his long-nailed girlfriend. In her still encampment, they watched the stars again. Thanking nature, machines, mother, unknown movements, for their newfound harvest on the ridge, strawberries. So we have a little visual thingy from the film, from a location visit that we did. So this is nothing final. <laughs> There's like some experimental narration going on in there, but that's not, not nothing to, that's not so far yet. So thanks.